Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to Florida Friendly Landscaping. Let's dig deep. So today we're going to talk about principles number four, mulch, and principle number five, attract wildlife. And welcome back for those who for those of you who have been watching this webinar series for the past few weeks, and if this is your first time watching, welcome. My name is Jennifer Pelham, and I'm the County Extension Director and Urban Horticulture Agent for the University of Florida IFAS Extension, Martin County. As always, I wanna start with an overview of Florida Friendly Landscaping for those of you who are just joining us for the first time today. Florida Friendly Landscape is Landscaping is an integrated approach to maintaining an attractive, colorful, and diverse yard. And the purpose of the program is to educate Floridians with science-based, environmentally friendly landscaping information and to teach those environmentally friendly practices uh, and to encourage Floridians to, to conserve and to protect water resources. So these are the nine principles that, are we, that we are covering during this webinar series, uh, Florida Friendly Landscaping, Let's Dig Deep. The first three weeks we covered right plant, right place, water efficiently and fertilize appropriately. Today we are gonna cover four and five, which is mulch and attract wildlife. And the next week we're gonna talk about managing yard pests. So this is the schedule. It's gonna be held every Wednesday, same time, same place at 11 a.m. All the principles can be found in the Florida Yards and Neighborhoods Handbook. This book is free online. If you participated in the past webinars, I sent you a link to, to download this publication. Or if you're local, you're welcome to stop by our office here in Stewart and pick up your own copy. So let's start talking about principle number four, mulch. I don't know about you, but I love mulch. I like the look of it, but I really love the smell of it, especially the fresh, fresh mulch when you're putting it out in your landscape. It just has that fresh, clean landscape smell to me. The mulch can be defined as any material placed on the soil surface in the landscape. It can provide many, many, many benefits to our landscape. It's very important to use mulch. And it goes, the, the benefits go way beyond just the aesthetics. Mulch can make your landscape look more attractive, but also holds many other benefits. And those benefits include, it buffers the soil temperature, meaning that it keeps the soil cool in the summer and it keeps the soil warm in the winter, discourages weeds, which I think is the best benefit of the mulch. It does retain the soil moisture. So after a rain event or irrigation, we'll have less evaporation if we have mulch covering the soil. It does protect our plants from mower or string trimmers, which I like to call that syndrome weed whacker blight. Do you ever see a tree that has weed whacker blight where it doesn't have, the tree doesn't have mulch around it to protect it and the landscaper is trying to get those grass blades that are growing right up next to the trunk and they can end up girdling the tree. Uh, with the weed whacker, the string trimmer. So that's why we want to have mulch placed around our trees to protect them and also protect people from running into them also. As, new, as mulch breaks down, if we use an organic mulch, it's going to add nutrients to our soil. It can help reduce runoff and erosion of our soil. And again, it just adds an overall beauty to the landscape. So there are two different types of mulch that you can use in your landscape. You can use organic mulch or inorganic mulch. Organic mulch is mulch that has come from something that is alive or it was once alive itself, including wood chips, pine needles, leaves. And then there's inorganic mulches. These are mulches that are inorganic like gravel and rock and rubber mulches. So the, the organic mulches are gonna break down over time so they're not permanent, but as they break down, they add nutrients to the soil. These are valuable nutrients that your plants can take up. It's almost like free fertilizer. The inorganic mulches are basically there forever until you remove them. They're not going to go anywhere, um, but they don't break down. So you're not going to get that added benefit of having that, that enriched soil. However, again, they don't break down. So they are there 
pretty much forever until you remove them. So some things you wanna consider when you're choosing mulch for your landscape. One is you wanna think about how you want it to look. We have mulch that comes in different colors, different textures. So you wanna make sure that, that you look at the color, the texture, the smell, and find one that meets the needs of what you want your landscape to look like. Also the longevity and durability. Some mulches are just gonna last longer in the landscape. We talked about inorganic mulches lasting almost forever, um, but there also are some organic mulches that lo last longer than other organic mulches. And we're gonna talk about those different types of mulches and talk about their decomposition rates. Source is, ve is very important. Can you get the mulch? Uh, there's a lot of mulches out there, but there might not be, that particular mulch might not be, be available in your town for you to readily get. Um, and then the price is always a concern. Um, some of the better mulches might be, be, be more expense, expensive and some of the, you know, some of the mulches are a lot cheaper. And then also think about changes to soil chemistry. Now this can take years and years and years, but if we use a lot of pine straw, that might add some acidity to our soils, which here in Martin County, that's a good thing because we, our soils are very alkaline. They're very high pH. So over time it can add, it can change the, the soil pH um, over many, many years though, not, not just instantly. Um, but also the soil chemistry, it changes as the organic mulches break down, they just, again, enrich the soil and they add more nutrients to the soil and they allow the soil to hold moisture longer and hold nutrients longer too. So these are some of the organic mulches that we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to talk about pine bark and pine needles, eucalyptus, malaleuca, utility waste, and also cypress. We're gonna mention cypress, but uh, just on a, a note, not just any spoilers, but cypress mulch is not recommended by the University of Florida. And I will go into why we don't recommend that when we get to that slide. And you can see these mulches all look a little different. Uh, some are larger, some have smaller pieces. Uh, the pine needles have a more natural look and, and they do have a little different coloration too. So let's talk about some of these mulches. The first one is my personal favorite. I love pine bark and pine nuggets. And I love it because it is a byproduct of the lumber industry. So the trees, the pine trees are grown for lumber, which means they are a renewable resource. So once they cut the trees down, they strip it of the bark, the bark turns and goes to, for mulch, the, the tree, the rest of the tree goes to lumber and then they replant those trees. So it's renewable, it's sustainable. I also love the pine bark nuggets, pine bark and the nuggets because they break down very slowly. So they're, they're one of the longest lasting organic mulches that we can have in the landscape. And they have proven by research to be the best mulch for weed control. And the reason why the pine bark does so well for weed control is because they are large pieces. These large pieces shade out the small weed seeds and the, the, the little weed plants. Um, the only bad part of the pine bark is that it can float away. So if you have a, a place that floods, you, you might see your pine bark floating away, but that happens with other mulches also. So it doesn't have that, it doesn't intertwine like, like some of the more fibrous mulches. But uh, to me, I think this is a superior mulch uh, to use in the landscape for the benefits mentioned. The next one is pine straw. Pine straw is a great mulch because a lot of times it's free. If you have pine trees already in your landscape or nearby, your neighbor might have some pine trees, you can rake those up and use them right uh, as mulch in your planting beds. Uh, if it's not free, it's, it's pretty expensive, inexpensive to get the pine straw and it gives your landscape that natural look. Uh, you can see if you have more of a natural landscape, maybe you have a lot of native plants and you like that look, pine straw uh, would be the choice for you. It does knit together very well, so it doesn't float like the pine bark does. Um, it, and uh, however, it does break down very quickly. So you're gonna be replenishing the pine needles on a regular basis. Now, um, it is least expensive versus uh, some of the other mulches, but you are gonna replenish it more. So you have that, that give and take there. Eucalyptus is another great mulch to use in your landscape, and this is readily available at the home and garden stores. Uh, it 
comes from tree plantations in Florida that are grown specifically for mulch. So where pine bark and pine needles uh, come from the pine tree, from the lumber industry, this, these eucalyptus trees are grown specifically just for mulch. So they grow the eucalyptus because it's a very fast growing tree. They cut them down, they mulch them, they replant them and they grow again. So again, this is another sustainable renewable resource because they're always replanting the eucalyptus and they're grown specifically just for mulch on these tree plantations. It has about a moderate breakdown uh, ratio, a uh, rate, I should say. It, it's a little faster than the, the pine bark, but it breaks down slower than the pine needles. So it's kind of in the middle there as far as breaking down. It has a nice, I would say a, a medium brown color to it and it is readily available at most garden centers. The next one is utility mulch or mixed hardwood mulch. These are usually free or very cheap from utility companies or tree trimming companies. You can typically call up a, a tree company and say, hey, if you have any mulch that you wanna get rid of, you can dump it in my driveway. Uh, cause they don't wanna have to take it to the, to the dump. Cause if they have to take it to the dump then they, it, charge the dump charges them to drop off the the tree trimmings uh, so a lot of times they don't mind dropping it off at your house uh, and you util utility companies will do the same the problem is that you don't know what you're getting so you're going to get a mix of everything you might get some pine you might get some oak you might get some invasive species that they cut down so it, it could be a little bit of everything mixed together so that means it might come with some weed seeds in it and it probably will come with some leaf matter in it. The leaf matter is not a problem because that will break down and add more nutrients to your soil. But the weed seeds uh, could be an issue. So that's something you just need to keep an eye out for. This isn't the best to use in your vegetable or flower gardens because of the weed seeds. They could outcompete some of your smaller uh, annual flowers. And uh, you definitely don't want to put it around your vegetable plants because you don't know where this is coming from. You don't know if there's any pesticides sprayed on, on these trees before they were cut down. However, this mulch is great for um, uh, planting beds around trees and, and shrubs, uh, driveways, walkways, and uh, in some natural areas. So if, you, if you live near some natural areas, this is a great mulch to use for that because it is so inexpensive. It does settle and break down very quickly though. So that's another uh, uh, negative aspect to this type of mulch. Some uh, municipalities will actually give away their tree trimming mulch. Uh, I know I knew of some in the past where they would just have a pyro of mulch always by um, uh, someplace on their property, the town property, you could just go and shovel it yourself and, and get the free mulch. So the next one is Malaluca. I also favor Malaluca. Uh, this is an, a great mulch to use. And the reason why it's so great is that it's made from exotic invasive trees that are found in the Everglades, the Malaluca trees. Malaluca trees were planted in, in the Everglades many, 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 many years ago to basically dry up the Everglades. A developer wanted the land uh, and Malaluca trees use a lot of water. Uh, however, they became very, very invasive in South Florida, and we have them here in Martin County as an invasive plant. And so there's a company called Flora Mulch. They're out of uh, Fort Myers area. They actually go into the Everglades and they harvest the Malaluca trees. They take them out of our natural areas, uh, remove them, and then they turn, it, turn the trees into mulch. And they also treat the the the, tr the mulch. So they do heat it to kill any weed seeds that may get mixed up in with the Malaluca. So you can rest assured that if you use Malaluca mulch, you're not spreading Malaluca seeds all over your landscape. It does break down very slowly and it knits together very nicely. So this is definitely a recommended mulch to use. Uh, however, it's more expensive than the pine bark and the eucalyptus and the pine straw. Um, and it's also can be very difficult to find. It's not carried in every uh, garden center, but if you go to Flora Mulch on their website, they will let you know where it's sold nearby. And here in Stewart, the closest location I found is in Jupiter. So that's not too far away, um, but it is more of a distance to use, but it is uh, again, a great, great uh, mulch to use in the landscape. 
And like I said earlier, the University of Florida does not re recommend the use of cypress mulch. Unfortunately, cypress mulch is what you find very easily in the garden centers. It's readily available and it's the least expensive in the garden centers. And that's unfortunate because we don't recommend it because we do not know the source of this mulch. A lot of this mulch is coming from cypress trees that are harvested in wetlands uh, in Florida and in the Southern United States. Uh, and those cypress trees are not replanted. They're just harvested for the mulch. Uh, so it's not a sustainable material to use in your land, in your landscape. So we do not recommend the use of cypress mulch. Then there are some inorganic mulches that you can use. Uh, the inorganic mulches include gravel, pebbles, lava rock. Like I said earlier, they do not contribute to the soil's nutrient content or water holding capabilities. Uh, however, they do last a very, very long time. Uh, it is recommended that you always put them on top of a landscape fabric first, because uh, if you don't, they'll just keep sinking down into the ground and they, they will disappear, I guess. They'll just keep going deeper and deeper and deeper in the ground. Um, however, we don't recommend rubber mulches. The rubber, mul rubber mulches are made from recycled tires, uh, so they they're least effective also in preventing weeds and they absorb heat. So they make your landscape very, very hot. Uh, so that could be damaging to your plants. And we don't really know as these tires pieces start to break down if they're leaking, leaching any toxic chemicals into the soil. So we don't recommend the use of rubber mulch. And if you look at that picture there, the rubber, rubber mulch looks very similar to our organic mulches, same color and everything. Um, but it's, it's actually the rubber mulch. Now this is used a lot in playgrounds and our walkways and stuff, but it's not recommended to use uh, in your landscape. So I have some questions here. One question was, does the dye in some of the mulches cause problems? I don't know I'd say if it causes problems, except I've noticed that it stains. Uh, it stains your fence, it stains your sidewalk, it stains your driveway, it stains your hands and your clothes. Um, I don't personally don't like the the red mulches or the dyed mulches. They, they can dye in brown, black, or red um, because I don't like to, um, to have that stain go just about everywhere in my landscape. I just like the natural look. Um, but the most of the dyed mulches are cypress mulch, unfortunately, but they just shouldn't cause any problems. Oh, and thank you. The the lows in um, and Port St. Lucie and Busher Stop carries floor mulch. So that's great to know. So we do have some more locations. I need to, to check out the website again and update my, my, my information. So the question is how much mulch do you need? I'm sure you're, you're like me. We go to the store, we buy our mulch, we get home, we put it out and we're always a couple bags short. And that's probably because like me, I did not calculate how much mulch I needed to apply the recommended rate. We recommend that you have, uh, use three inches of mulch to obtain the benefits that we spoke about. So to have good weed control, to keep the soil cool in the summer and warm in the winter, uh, in order to prevent evaporation of the water, you wanna have your mulch at least three inches thick. So how do we figure that out? We multiply the length of our landscape bed. So you find the area, the length, the length times width, that gives you the area, and then multiply that square footage by 0.25. And this will give you uh, three inches of mulch, uh, as far as three inches of mulch you would need for a square footage. Then you divide that by 27, um, to 27 to yield the cubic yards of mulch needed for your project. A lot of times they sell, mar they sell mulch by the, the uh, yard or the cubic yard. Sometimes they just call it a yard. Um, and that will give you how many yards you need. Most bags of mulch are two cubic feet. So it will take 13 and a half bags to equal one cubic yard. So that's a lot of math for you to do. It's not as complicated as the fertilizer math that we talked about last week. Um, but this can give you some examples on how, uh, how to calculate how much mulch you will need. Oh, and, and also the, the Lowe's in West Palm has the flora mulch. 
So again, we want to maintain a layer of three, th three inches. And I always have that question, well, when it's time to replenish my mulch, do I need to take out the old mulch and put in fresh mulch? And the answer is no, do not remove old mulch. That old mulch is starting to break down. It's already starting to add those nutrients to the soil. As it starts to, to diminish in height, just add a fresh layer. Maybe it, it's only two inches thick now. So just add one inch of mulch on top. Uh, you want to make sure that you keep your mulch away from the base of the trees. I've seen a lot of plants die from being mulched to, to death, literally mulched to death, um, where they pile the mulch over top of the base of the base of the plant and that the plant thinks it's buried too deep, it can't breathe, it gets too much moisture around the base and it, and it basically rots. So keep the mulch away like you see in the photos here. Uh, you see that that crepe myrtle on the right up top, it has too much mulch around it. On the bottom, they took the mulch away from the base of the plant. That's what you want. You want to have that base of the plant to breathe. And we do not encourage or advocate volcano mulching here in Florida. That's that poor tree you see on the bottom left picture. Uh, that definitely will kill a tree in no time here in Florida. You can imagine that moisture and the humidity getting caught up there on that base of that, that trunk of that tree and it can just rot it. So there's a question, um, a, lot of, a lot of mulches, let me go back to mulches. There's a question about blended mulches. And the, a lot of the blended mulches have found that they still are primarily cypress mulch, uh, up to 90% when they say they're blended. So just be careful, read the sources of the bag of the blended mulch and see where it's coming, coming from. Yes, you wanna pull the mulch away from the base of all your trees and all your plants. So you don't want mulch buried around up any, any uh, shrub um, or, or tree. You don't want it to be pulled away. You want it to pull it away a couple inches from, all, from the bases of all your plants, just not trees, all of them. Yep, good question. So any other questions on mulch? Cause we're gonna go into attracting wildlife next. Principle number five attracting wildlife. Now, when we talk about attracting wildlife, I'm not talking about unwanted wildlife. So we're not trying to attract raccoons and rabbits and coyotes and, and all those guys. We're trying to attract the, the friendly wildlife, the butterflies and the birds and the pollinators. It's very important to create wildlife habitat. You can see this photo here. If you were a bird flying above and you look down at all these houses and turf grass, you might say to yourself, where would I wanna live? There's no, nothing here that, that I'm attracted to. Uh, maybe the trees that are off to the right side or up in the back, that would be a great place for the bird to live, but there's nothing around these houses that would attract much wildlife. So the urban development displaces our natural areas that the wildlife are used to. And we can create wildlife habitat right in our own backyards. And that is great because it provides viewing opportunities for us. It's always fun to watch the birds and the butterflies and the bees fly around. Uh, and you also give a place for the wildlife to live. So we're gonna cover these 10 steps for landscaping for wildlife. Um, you can see here we're going to limit the lawn, increase vertical layering, provide snags and bush piles, water, native vegetation, houses and feeders, uh, managing pests, reducing pesticide use, and also in expanding the scale of habitat. So let's go through these one by one. The first is to limit the amount of lawn. You know, I'm not opposed to lawn. I think lawn has a very important part in the landscape. But again, like we talked about in the first class, we want to make sure we limit our lawn areas because they are high maintenance. They take a lot of mowing, they take a lot of uh, water, more, more water than typical plants, uh, and also uh, more fertilizer than your, nor than your regular landscape. And they also aren't very appealing to the wildlife. You can imagine the, there's nowhere to hide in your lawn. 
Uh, so if you have a lot of lawn to try to attract wildlife, you want to reduce your reduce your your lawn. Uh, you can do this by simply not mowing. So if there's an area of your lawn that you don't need to mow and you can let the grass and, and the other plants emerge out of that area, that's fine. Just by having long grass and allowing some of those other seeds in the grass to germinate, you can create a, a little habitat for the, the animals or the, the wildlife. You can replace some of your lawn with ground cover. Ground cover is a little taller than the grass. You're not mowing it constantly, obviously. So then it gives more habitat for the wildlife. You can increase or add more planting beds or planting bed islands in your landscape. And you can plant a butterfly garden. A butterfly garden is attractive, not only to butterfly, butterflies, but to all of our pollinators. So butterfly and pollinator gardens, they need to have certain aspects to them. We're not going to go in depth. We could do a whole whole webinar just on butterfly gardens, which I think I might plan one for, for a few months from now. But for a butterfly garden, we want to make sure that we provide plants for the larva or the caterpillars and also for the adults or the butterflies. Because if you probably remember from grade school, butterflies are first caterpillars uh, before they're butterflies, the, the young immature stage of a butterfly is a caterpillar. And caterpillars are, are host specific, which means they eat certain plants. And if you plant those certain plants that they like, for example, um, the monarch caterpillar likes milkweed. If you plant milkweed in your butterfly garden or in your landscape, those butterflies will find it. They, if you plant it, they will come. They will come to your landscape. They will lay their eggs on your milkweed. The caterpillars will hatch, and soon you'll have uh, you'll, you'll have little caterpillars eating your entire milkweed. Uh, the caterpillar in the top photo here is the golf fritterary, and the golf fritterary likes the passion flower, which is the photo on the top right. So you plant passion flower, you're going to get some golf fritteraries coming by and laying their eggs, and then those are what the caterpillars look like. That caterpillar looks kind of scary, but you can rest assured that particular one is not poisonous if, if you touch it. Those aren't spines that are gonna, gonna sting you like some of those non-friendly caterpill, uh, caterpillars that, that you may come across now and then. And then down on the bottom picture, we have, we have the, the butterfly, we have nectar plants. So nectar plants are important for the adult butterfly. So you want to have the, both of these in your the, the larva plants and the nectar plants for your butterfly garden. If you're trying to attract more pollinators, you could also put some pollinator boxes, nesting boxes in your landscape. Here's an inexpensive one that you see over on the far right photo. That's, that's just a piece of block uh, on the bottom there. And they drilled different size holes in that piece of wood because different pollinate, pollinators prefer different holes to nest in. And these are gonna be our solitary pollinators. So they're not gonna be honeybees because honeybees are, live in a colony, but some of our solitary bees like our bumblebees and our orchid bees and some other pollinators that we have here, they, they prefer, they, they, they are solitary so they don't live in a colony, they live by themselves. And this is their nesting boxes that they would like. And then the photo above that is uh, just different sizes of bamboo. That can also serve as a nesting box, some bamboo in a large piece of uh, PVC piping. The next thing we may want to do is increase our vertical layering. Vertical layering is the different heights of your plants. So you want to have tall plants for some of your birds that like to be up high. Um, you might have some medium sized plants, some birds that prefer to be a little lower to the ground. You can have lower plants for some of those smaller uh, wildlife that like to, to forage on the ground. So having these different heights is very helpful to the plants. So trees, sh tall shrubs, medium shrubs, medi uh, perennials and ground covers are all important to have in your landscape to create that, create that diversity of height for the for the wildlife and that increases their, their cover, their habitat, and also more feeding opportunities for them. You also wanna provide snags and brush piles. Now this is a hard one probably for some and maybe if you live in a homeowners association, you might not be allowed to do this, but if you have a dead tree or in your landscape, 
it's okay just to keep it there as long as it's not going to fall on your house or your car or your neighbor's landscape. Um, you can cut it down to about 15 feet tall and leaving that dead tree in place is very helpful to uh, some of our birds that like to dwell in uh, in those snags and uh, in brush piles like the woodpeckers. They love to build their 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 build cavities in those dead trees. Uh, sometimes they'll also use them for feeding. So you can see that butterfly, that, that, that woodpecker there is digging for some of the, the insects that will feed on the dead wood. If you don't have a snag, this sounds funny, but you can plant one. So just find a dead tree someplace, cut it down and you can bury it a couple feet deep and have your own dead dead snag uh, in your landscape or you can also lay it on your side even laying even laying the piece of wood on the side is going to have some opportunity for insects to start feeding on that and then here comes your wildlife and the birds starting to peck at that uh, looking for the food you can also keep a nice uh, brush pile nearby the brush pile uh, over time will decay but before that uh, it's going to attract some some beneficial insects that are going to start to to feed on that and start to decay it which the birds are going to come in and some other uh, wildlife will come in to feed on those insects. We want to make sure we provide water for our wildlife. So having a bird bath is definitely an easy thing to do to have some water for the wildlife. For butterflies, butterflies can't land in water to drink. They like to land on wet sand the, and then they'll, they'll lap up the water from the wet sand. So have a plant saucer and have some sand in there and keep that wet, uh, just wet enough, but not that it's too puddling that the butterflies can come in and feed on that. I couldn't find a picture of any uh, a wet sand and butterflies, but they, that's what they prefer to, to drink the, their water. Uh, also a small pond, if you wanna have an ornamental pond, you can be fancy like the one you see here or just simple as having a container that can hold water and have some plants in there. Uh, maybe a little bubbler to attract the uh, the uh, wildlife for the water. Um, a lot of people are concerned with water in their landscape because of mosquitoes. Um, but just a note, if it's moving water, like you see that fountain in the picture on the right, as long as that fountain's always on and moving that water, the mosquitoes cannot lay their eggs in that that moving water. They need to have stagnant water. So with the bird bath, that they could lay their eggs in the bird bath, but as long as you're going and always uh, every few days overflowing that water. So if there is any mosquito eggs or larva, you're, you're overflowing it to wash them down onto the ground so they die. Uh, that will help with the mosquito uh, population uh, as far as water goes. Make sure to plant native vegetation. Uh, our wildlife, our native wildlife, they're used to our native vegetation. That's where they get most of their food sources. That's what type of plants they like to, to live in. Um, so having a native fire, um, fire, fire bush like you see on the top photo there uh, will attract a lot of the butterflies. Um, and the, the pollinators are having a butterberry. The butterberry in the middle picture there provides needed fruit uh, berries for our wildlife. And by the way, you can eat that those berries also. Um, and the mimosa is a great ground cover for pollinators. You can see there's a honeybee there busy, busy working, uh, gathering that pollen. Have some bird houses and bird feeders in your landscape. Now this takes a little more research so you're gonna to have to go on and see what type of birds are you seeing in your, in your neighborhood or what birds should be in the area that you live and then find out what type of boxes they like. Some birds like to have different size holes, whether they like a small hole or a large hole or, or, some, or a specific shape of a nesting box. Uh, you, some, some of the birds like to, to be really high in the air, 15 feet high, where some might like it lower to the ground. Um, so you need to do your research to see what type of birds you want to attract and then get a bird box or build a bird box that fits those needs of that bird. And eventually they will find your birdhouse. You want to make sure that you keep feeders at least 15 feet away from other vegetation if possible uh, to try to keep those, those pesky squirrels out of your bird feeder. They will find your bird feeder um, and I'm sure even that one you see there in the middle of, of the landscape, I'm sure those squirrels still find a way to get to that bird feeder because they, they do. 
They're pretty smart creatures. Um, but try to keep, uh, if you want to try to keep the squirrels out so you can leave the food uh, to the birds. Make sure that you're always cleaning your bird feeders, whether it be the hummingbird feeder um, or your other feeders, because uh, some of the seed can get old. It can start to get, if it gets wet, it could sprout. So you want to clean that out. And also with the hummingbird feeder, the, the sugar water can spoil. So you don't want to uh, poison the, the hummingbirds if they come and feed on that. So that's something to do on a, on a regular basis too. Uh, the photo on the far right is a bat house. So bats are wildlife that are beneficial. We do not have vampire bats here in Florida. Um, so you don't have to worry about any, but any bats biting you. Um, they are great mosquito control uh, wildlife. So they will eat the mosquitoes. Uh, so it's great to have bat houses in your landscape too, if you have room for them. A uh, bat house should be placed at least 15 feet high on a pole or on the side of a tree. Um, or if there's a building that's that high, you can place it there too. Uh, inside the box is rough wood. So it allows the bats to grasp in uh, the sides of the wood so they can climb in there and nest. And then once uh, it starts to turn dusk, you'll see the bats coming at, flying out and starting to uh, go after those mosquitoes that are out there. So they are very, very beneficial. Yes, Caitlin said that bat poop is very stinky. So put it, put it far from your house. Yeah, that bat guano, uh, which is used a lot of times in uh, cosmetics, by the way, it's organic, um, but it, it can, can be stinky, but it's also a great additive to your, your landscape and to your plants uh, as you're know, adding that organic matter with all the nutrients in it too. The University of Florida actually has a large bat house up in Gainesville and people go up there every night just to sit and watch the thousands and thousands of bats come out from this bat house. And if you get there one day and you find the, the bat house keeper, uh, if you bring your own five gallon bucket, he'll actually fill it up with, with bat guano for you. So you can take that home and, and add it to your, and compost it and add it to your, um, your landscape. We want to make sure that we, we remove any exotic invasive plants. Now, this is a fight that we're, we're always fighting this. We're always fighting those exotic invasive plants. And the reason why they're so bad is that they, they, they grow faster and larger than a lot of our native plants. So they, they take over habitats very easily. Uh, so they can kill out our native vegetation. Our, our native vegetation is important for our wildlife. So um, here we have some carrot wood with the, with, you see it with the yellow fruit. Uh, that's a tree, large shrub tree type species that's invasive. The top photo with the red berries is the Brazilian pepper. I'm sure everybody's familiar with the Brazilian pepper. If you crush the leaf, it smells like turpentine. So that's how you can identify Brazilian pepper without having the berries on it. And then the bottom photo is the air potato. So all three of these are, very, are invasive, invasive in South Florida, and there's many more invasive plants. I, again, we could do a whole, whole webinar just on invasive plants. Uh, the University of Florida is working on trying to find ways to eliminate these invasive species. They ha actually have released uh, with the Department of Agriculture a, uh, a air potato beetle that feeds on the air potato vine. Uh, it, and, you can rest assured that these insects that they release are, are tested and tried for, for years and year, years to make sure they do not harm any other organism, any other plant uh, in, our, in Florida. So uh, the air potato beetles have been released now for many years and they are starting to slowly de uh, decrease the occurrence of the air potato vine. And then just last year, we released, not we, but the University of Florida and Department of Agriculture released a thrip, a thrip for, the, um, for the Brazilian pepper. So Brazilian pepper thrips have now been released in some large areas, such as some of the large ranches and natural areas in Florida. And the thrips will feed on the leaves of the Brazilian pepper. So some good news as far as that goes. 
And this is a, something I know pets are true to everybody's heart, but pets can be uh, a nuisance to the wanted wildlife in our backyard. So, you know, cats and dogs, they love to chase the birds, even the well-fed cats and dogs will chase birds just for fun. Um, so maybe putting a collar on your cat or on your, on your dog that has a bell on it that can scare away the birds so they can't sneak up on them is, is important. Um, more, a better solution is to keep your cats indoors if you can. And, and try, not, try to teach your dogs not to scare the wildlife and maybe have their toys out there that they can play with instead of, instead of trying to chase the birds and, and the butterflies and, and such. But if, you, if your pets scare off too many, too many wildlife, they're not gonna to wanna to come back to your yard. We wanna reduce our pesticide use. So we get this question a lot about using pesticides and protecting our pollinators. And there's a way that you can still use pesticides and still protect our pollinators. And the, the best rule is never, well, the best rule is to keep your plants healthy. So if you plant the right plant for the right place, like we learned in se uh, this first session, uh, our plants are a lot happier and healthier and they can ward off insects and diseases a lot, a lot better, the, the bad insects, we should say, and, and diseases. Um, but if your plants do get insect pests, because that does happen, we are in Florida, we have a lot of insects, the rule is to never spray any plants that are in bloom. Because if your plants are in bloom, then it's likely that the pollinators are coming to your plants. Uh, the bumblebees, the honeybees, the butterflies, the wasps, all those pollinators are coming and visiting those flowers. So if you have a plant that has pest problems and it's flowering, hopefully you can wait till the, till the blooms are gone before you go ahead and spray. Another rule is that only use pesticides early in the morning or late at night when the pollinators are not actually uh, out visiting the flowers. So the honeybees will be back at their nest. You know, the, the bumblebees have gone you know, away for the night. The butterflies have, have settled down for the night. Um, so we don't wanna uh, spray them directly, obviously with the pesticides. We wanna wait till they're not, they're not active. Let's see. And then also we want to expand the scale of habitat. So it's great if you do all these things in your backyard and you're creating a great uh, place for the wildlife to come and visit, that's all, that's all wonderful. But if you can get your neighbors to do this, if you can get your HOA common areas to do this, and if the whole entire neighborhood can expand the habitat, that's gonna be better off for the wildlife as a whole. Uh, so we want neighborhood-wide habitats. So with that, uh, we're going to review uh, principle four and, and five uh, with mulch. Make sure that you choose the best mulch for your situation. Mulch three inches deep to get the benefits that mulch provides and replenish it as needed. Keep the mulch away from the base of all plants so you don't bury them too deep. And also as a reminder, the University of Florida does not re recommend the use of cypress mulch because the, of the unknown sources that, they, that the mulch comes from. To attract wildlife, create habitat for wildlife, make sure you provide food and water and use pesticides responsibly and also expand the scale of habit. And with that, I will take any questions that you may have and if you have questions, um, uh, there were some questions about a certification backyard habitat program. The University of Florida does have that program. You can actually certify your backyard as a backyard wildlife habitat. If you want more information on that, just send me an email and I will send you out that information. So it basically just consists of you drawing up a little plan and, and writing up a few paragraphs on how your, your backyard is a wildlife habitat. And you can get this really cute sign for your yard that says that you've done, I've done, I think it says, uh, I've done something wild in my, in my yard. Um, so it's, it's really cute that you can put up. And if anybody uh, wants any lists, a uh, question about a list, a list of exotic plants, just send me an email to remind me and I'll send you out that list. Um, I will also email you the uh, a reference sheet on mulch 
and attract wildlife. For those of you who have attended in the past, in the afternoons, I do send the, that information out to you. I hope you're finding it very useful. Uh, one of our master gardeners has created that reference sheet for you. If you have any questions, you can always contact the Martin County Master Gardeners or the, ma or the Master Gardeners that are in your local county with questions. You can also go on our EDIS website, which is our, our website that contains all of our publications on a wide variety of topics, including uh, mulch and wildlife. And next week, we're going to talk about managing yard pests responsibly. So we're going to talk about, we talked, we had one slide on that today, but we're going to dig deeper into that and talk about how to identify pests in the landscape and how to manage them and treat for pests responsibly. So I hope everybody enjoyed the webinar today. And again, if you have any questions, you can always email them to me and I will see you next week. So thank you again for joining me today and have a wonderful afternoon.